when Jock Lewis was killed in December 1941, he was really lost. And he, and he turned the, the SAS into, he recruited the likes of uh, Fitzroy MacLean and, and Randolph Churchill, who really weren't suited to this sort of warfare. And for the first six months of 1942, as Guy Prendergast, the CEO of the LRDG, described it, it was like something out of Gilbert and Sullivan. Some of these I think, I think, very daring raids, but yeah. useless. I think I okay. So my take on this is that is that David Sterling, what he's really really good at, and I'm, I'm going to go on using this. He, he iterates, right? So after the first operation, he iterates. Him and Jock Lewis have that discussion to use the LRDG, and the reason they use the LRDG is because he's got drunk at Shepherds with Prendergast. Now the LRDG and the SAS fall out later on because basically El Detachment SAS is hopelessly disorganised. Now we can talk about that. I think the tragedy is is that what Sterling was good at was filling his capability gaps. From founding the unit, he knew he was a disorganised guy, right? But there are lots of disorganised guys. I mean, you know, famously, Richard Branson didn't know the difference between net and gross profit when he was running Virgin Airlines age 50. Hello and welcome to the pod, Yuletide style, as I have a debate between two SAS historians thrashing it out as to David Sterling's role in the founding and establishment of the SAS in World War II. Gavin Mortimer has written an acclaimed history, The Phony Major, and Tom Petch's Speed, Aggression and Surprise both deal with the subject. They've joined me in previous episodes, so you can go back and listen to those if it piques your interest. And Gavin joined me earlier in the year to talk about the TV show, SAS Rogue Heroes. Next week, I have a chat with Gordon Corrigan and Gary Sheffield on our Greatest British Commanders series as we take on Field Marshal Douglas Haig, Butcher Haig or Hero of the Great War. Please do share with friends. It really helps the pod grow. This is my final episode before Christmas Day. So I'd like to wish all you listeners out there a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And if that's not your sort of thing, thank you very much for listening anyway. I've really enjoyed firing these episodes out and happily seen the numbers increase. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. You can get hold of me. I'm on the X, the Twitter. Links are in the show notes. With that said, I'll hand you over to Gavin Mortimer, Tom Petch and myself on David Sterling and his role in the founding of the SAS. Gavin Mortimer, Tom Petch, welcome. Uh, welcome to the the back. Welcome back to the pod. You're both well, fairly. You've both been on at least once before. It's yeah. a great pleasure to have you on, and I am having you both on because you've you've both previously joined to talk about the SAS in World War Two, obviously, and then a little bit more exactly. We've discussed the founding and the origins of the SAS, and as I was uh, having a um, a glass of something quite strong with Tom a few weeks ago we were just sort of daydreaming thinking wouldn't it be great to have Gavin on uh, with Tom to talk about the origins of the SAS we're going to keep it nice and friendly because <laughs> I know you're both hugely respectful of each other's work both authors of of really good books that came out is it Tom's your came out last year I think and Gavin earlier on last year in 2022 so I know that that's me just going on a, 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 a bit of a, a diatribe there, but if we kick off really, do you, I wanted to start with, it's very murky, the beginning of the SES. There were no, there doesn't seem to have been any kind of, I guess that helps with a lot of people's different views on how it all started. But I think it's fair to say, Gavin, if we start with you, you're a little bit clearer that there is one individual who has has really not had as much? In fact, it's probably true of both of you. But Gavin, in your case, you think Bill Sterling hasn't had enough attention, and Tom, you probably think Dudley Clark hasn't had enough attention. So I thought, Gavin, if we start with you, is that a fair summary of of, of your view? Yeah, absolutely, it is. And when you say about murky, uh, you're quite right. And it's very interesting. The first line of a Phantom Major, which is a book that. Uh, while I find entertaining, in terms of accuracy, it's a sort of a, a three out of 10. But the first line in the acknowledgements of that, uh, needless to say, the SAS did not keep detailed records of their operations in the Western Desert. I don't know why it's needless to say, that's superfluous. I mean, the um, when, when Bill Sterling raised two SAS 
in May 43. They kept very detailed records. And in fact, it's interesting because our detachment, which was, as uh, as Tom will describe, was, was a brainchild of, of, of Dudley Clark, um, when that was raised in um, by, uh, well, as I put it, uh, David and Bill Sterling in, in the summer of 41, the initial operations, they did keep detailed records. There's quite a lot of information by the survivors of the inaugural operation on the 16th, 17th of November, 1941. Uh, and similarly, Maine kept a, uh, ma- made a report on, on his raid in Tamit in um, December, 1941. And then thereafter, it stopped when really David Sterling, in, in, in the first six months of 1942, when David Sterling, as I put it, just went on these gallivanting operations, which achieved very little. They were they were wonderfully swashbuckling, but fairly incompetent. Um, and so that allowed David Sterling in the Phantom Major to, to really rewrite the history. And, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Tom, I, I, as you said, I... I disagree with Tom in that Dudley Clark was had had a great part in 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 the SAS uh, other than the name and the, and the, and the sort of the the, uh, the deceptive quality to it. Bill, uh, where I really agree with Tom is how Bill Fraser has been written out of it. That was David Sterling. He, of course, um, also wrote the or diminished the role of the Long Range Desert Group. Uh, of Paddy Main, but particularly his brother, who's mentioned four times in the index in in the Phantom Major. So that's right. It, it, it's this. It, it's the the rewriting of the history of the SS by David Sterling, 1958, uh, which is a very significant. That was three years after the death of Paddy Main. So he didn't touch the history of the SS while Paddy Main was alive. But as soon as he was dead, that enabled Sterling. To, to make out that it was really just him. Well, I can see Tom is itching. <laughs> itching. Yeah, we hit, hit a lot of bases there, Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're in my 22 and going towards the try line in rugby. Time. <laughs> right, uh, yeah, okay. So maybe maybe knock the Virginia Cowles thing first, right? So I don't buy, and, and this is this is something you, you have said, Gavin, I don't buy that Sterling waited for Paddy Main to die uh, in order to tell the story of the SAS. And in fact, there's documentary evidence that Paddy Main and um, David Sterling were going to write a book together uh, about the SAS, and that would have involved Paddy Main. He died before that book uh, came into existence. And that book was sponsored by Carol Mather. I mean, you probably know this. I've got the... And basically, they he decided... Mather decided that because the, the, um, the record was so sketchy, uh, that it was high time that they did something about it. So I've got... Here we go. So he basically said... It's high time we, we we thought of putting together the record that of all that happened in L Detachment, the SS Brigade in the Desert, between 1941 and 1943. And then he goes on, it's got the book's got David's blessing, and we'll write the introduction and possibly one other chapter. Uh, Mrs. Sterling, so that's Bill Sterling's lot, wife, would edit it. And the chapter suggestions are one, Genesis, David Sterling, two, trips to the LRDG, Paddy Main, three, Crete with George Jellico. Four and five Benghazi raid, etc., and then Sandy Scratchley comes in at seven. George Alliston eight, and then the link up with, would be done by Mike Sadler. So this was this was like in the pipeline, and and he even goes on to say that Paddy and David will decide at what point chapter two begins. So I think they were all working on it, and I do not buy this. And and, and this is something where our our sort of uh, narrative really will differ. Is is David and Paddy? I do not think hate each other. The others guts. I think Elder Datchen was a highly dysfunctional organisation, a brilliant one, and there were very strong characters in it, and Jock Lewis and David Sterling talk about arguing quite a lot, and there are two very well-documented bust-ups between Blair Paddy Main and David Sterling. But I don't think they hated each other's, other's guts, and I think that the war record is, you know, Virginia Cowles is not a patsy, she's a good war correspondent. It's just Paddy Main died before they got down the road of writing a book together. And could it be then that Paddy Main dies um, very sadly in a car crash and David Sterling then sees, oh, okay, this is a bit of an opportunity. But an opportunity for what? I mean, if, if, let, maybe that's to, to inflate his... his um... Why would, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. If David Sterling's motivation, if David Sterling's motivation is self-publicity, yes. If we accept that. I just don't accept that because I think that David 
If you look back at David Stirling's history in the 20s, I think what he's about is pushing the narrative of the SAS. And let's not forget, the SAS is not a popular formation headquarters. It gets disbanded in 1945. It then, it then has, and I'll be really honest with you, because we now go into the official secrets, it has trouble getting work constantly through its existence. The fact is that somebody has to keep it up front and centre in the minds of high command. And that person from 1940 was David Sterling, I think. Gavin probably doesn't agree with me, so you probably need to say something like Gavin about <laughs> that sort of nonsense, Tom, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, firstly, that book you refer to, which I, I touch on in the, the collaborative history of the, um, of the SAS, that was in 1950-51. And of course, the question is, why didn't it ever, ever come to fruition? We don't know, but it may have been. It was very much, apart from Paddy Main, it was very much written by David Sterling's inner circle. But I think an important point to make is that in The Phantom Major, this is where this, in my opinion, and I know that Tom and I disagree with, um, with our view of, of Paddy Main, but it, interestingly, in 1946, David Sterling gave an interview to a, um, an American war correspondent who was writing a book about commando units they weren't really called special forces back then and when David Sterling talked he said that he recruited Paddy Main from an infantry depot and he also said that he got in he got permission to raise uh, this unit he never mentioned it was only it was in the Phantom Major that two myths sprang up the first that Paddy Main was under close arrest when he was recruited into the SAS I think everyone now really agrees that that wasn't the case, that he was indeed at a loose end, and uh, that's how he was recruited into the, uh, into the SAS. And also this myth that David Sterling broke into Grey Pillars, the um, GHQ, uh, while recovering from this very serious parachute accident in June 1941. Uh, and of course, we saw this in, in uh, the BBC Rogue Heroes. As I say in the phony major, Bill Sterling... Uh, simply handed the document, the, the idea, to GHQ because Bill Sterling was working as the personal assistant to Lieutenant General Arthur Smith, who was Wavell's chief of staff. But of course, that's not really very glamorous. It's all a bit boring. So in the Phantom Major, David Sterling just began to create these myths that have been being picked up. And because Paddy Main wasn't alive, uh, and of course, Jock Lewis was killed in December 1941, and, and Bill Fraser... Uh, who, who Tom writes about very uh, eloquently in his book, had ruined himself through drink and, and had a, a very tragic post-war life. There was no one really left to challenge David Sterling's version. Yeah. So. I, I, my, my, my take is that Junior Cowles is a very good correspondent. You know, she, she's got, she writes a book at the start of the war. She works for the Chicago Sun in Cairo. She's not a patsy. She is an author. So she embellishes. You, you can say it's David Sterling making stuff up. That story about Grey Pillars, he does make that up. That's complete fantasy. Except that, and I, and I knew there would be a record, and there is a record, of the first meeting between Neil Ritchie and, and Sir David Sterling. And the truth of it is he has got into the headquarters somehow. This is before he's broken his leg, because Neil Ritchie describes his meeting. These are one of the cassettes in the, of his record in the, in the Imperial War Museum. And he describes this tall Scots guards officer walking into his office, and he's never met him before. Now, that, that, that also trashes this idea that there was some sort of nepotism, that he'd been shooting with Neil Ritchie and all of that. That's not true. He got into the headquarters somehow. He pitches the parachute idea. And what's really interesting, at that point, Neil Ritchie's just taken over as uh, head of operations, or he's about to. He's in the same corridor as Arthur Tedder. And, and at that point, General Archibald Wavell is in command. And the two of them that morning have had a conversation about creating a parachute force. So Neil Ritchie obviously thinks this Scots Guards office has something to do with it. He's nothing to do with it. He's somehow got in his office. So Neil Ritchie takes him down the corridor to meet Arthur Tedder, who's the RAF man, to talk about this parachute. And not until they get into Arthur Tedder's office does he say, how the hell did you get in here? And Sterling goes, oh, I made the sentry look the other way. And at that point, Neil Ritchie, and this is Neil Ritchie's record, and Neil Ritchie, there's a lot of faults with Neil Ritchie, but he doesn't make shit up. And he said, and he said at that point, I thought this guy was quite useful, and I'd, I'd sponsor him. So that is a, a version of, which sort of backs, actually, Sterling's, Sterling's record there. I think Sterling's thing, again, going back to how he creates the SES, is he exaggerates everything. He pretends they're parachuting when they're not. He exaggerates their raids, he exaggerates what happens. But again, that's to keep them in the mind of uh, GHQ with whom he's fighting to get the unit established. 
Is that being quite kind to David Sterling? Because if you found any other officer commanding a, a detachment exaggerating their uh, achievements, the senior officers would take quite a dim view, wouldn't they? No, the senior officers don't. Okay, so I think I'm going to I'm going to use an analogy, right? We're talking about a founder. So the uh, this is why I believe David Sterling is the founder of the SES. The founder of, for example, Apple is Steve Jobs. The founder of Tesla is Elon Musk. The founder of Virgin is Richard Branson. Sometimes these people, if you take Steve Jobs, early days, Apple, are not necessarily the type of people that you'd even want running an organization, but they're startup CEOs. And I put Sterling in that in that brain. He manipulates, he does a lot of things, but to be fair to him, and this is Jock Lewis saying this in a letter to his father, he says, I created the SAS from inside, so because Jock Lewis sets up the training for the SAS. And David Sterling set it up from the outside because he had to fight the corner with GHQ. And Jock Lewis says, of the two, fighting the corner with GHQ was the harder. And I think that's not a bad analogy. It's like if you're a startup CEO, you've got to go and get finance for your company. That's the harder job than building electric cars or Apple computers. So then is it, is it just to come in on that, see where I again, where I the evidence I put forward in the phony major is, for example, Charles Johnson, who uh, was a diplomat in the British embassy and shared a flat. Of, Peter Sterling, who we haven't mentioned, was the third Sterling brother in Cairo in the summer of 1941. And he was a third secretary at the British embassy. And um, they had a flat where. The three Sterlings would often, when they, when the three of them were in Cairo, they were, it was a base, really. Um, and Charles Johnson stayed there, and there were some great parties, by all accounts. But when he wrote his memoirs, he described them very much as both the... Uh, they'd acquired military fame in the Middle East as founders of a special air service. And he says that Bill and David had created a small, irregular unit deploying all the weight of their private contacts to overcome the violent opposition of a military bureaucracy. And then Roy Farron, who's a great figure of two SAS, the, the Paddy Main, if you like, of two SAS, in his book, Wing Dagger, which he wrote in 1947, he again says that Bill and David were the pioneers. So I think, and, and the joke was, as I say in the phony major, that SAS stood in, in 1941, 42 in North Africa. The joke was that SAS was Sterling and Sterling. And the SAS war diary, um, published in 1946 and, and, and then re-released to, general, uh, to the general public in 2011, says that it very interestingly says that Bill describes Bill Sterling as the man from the shadows. But with his brother, uh, he was in Cairo in 1941 and, um, and discussed the idea with his brother. Now, I, I agree with Tom that, that they, David very much had the personality. He was the front man. But Bill in GHQ was the brains behind it. Yeah, see, I mean, if, I mean, I'm not going to dispute that Bill, and we can talk about, let's talk about Bill in a minute, because that's a specific subject. Yeah, because you're a bit of a Bill sceptic, would that be fair to you? Well, okay, let's not get into Bill Sterling, because we have to deal with that in the round, and I'm very happy to talk about Bill Sterling. I will not deny Bill Sterling's in the flat. Undoubtedly, he talks to his brother, undoubtedly. However, if we're playing poker, Gavin, I'm going to lay three really big cards on the table. The first of which is the one that you refer to, which is the document that is in Karamada's file, which is called, I've got a second. Oh, wait, one caller. Here we go. It's the it's the document that's titled um, Training of Parachute Troops, right? And that is signed by David Sterling and it's undated, okay? But because it turns up in Mather's file and Jock Lewis's files, we we got to assume that they were, they we know they were pitched the idea by David Sterling. We've got that on record in my great, great grandfather's hotel. Mather is pitched, he turns him down. Jock Lewis is pitched, he accepts, right? That's that's the first, there's no Bill Sterling in that. And neither of them mentioned Bill Sterling. And then the second, and I think this is key to maybe the difference between our narratives, is the 16th of July 41 document, which is, uh, which is in Clark's beam file. So just quickly talk about Dudley Clark. At this point, there are fake parachutes, SS parachutes running around Cairo, two of them. Dudley Clark has created the illusions in SAS. He's posed as an SAS colonel on a train to Palestine and dropped a letter on the Japanese spy, Charge Affairs. He's been to Palestine to set up the fake SAS base in Jordan. He's building fake gliders on Helwan Air, Airfield. He's building fake gliders, SS gliders on Fukker Airfield. 
and there are fake SAS parachutes dropping out of the air over Cairo. At which point, this turns up in his Abin file. And the point about the Abin file, this is the file for the fake SAS. And this is signed by David Sterling, 16th of July, 1941, case for retention of parish, a few special service troops, which you'll have seen at yeah, this document, Darren, right? And then you cut to the first meeting of the SS, 27th of July, 1941, held in the training branch of GHQ, attended by Dudley Clark and David Sterling. So I've got like, I, there's no Bill Sterling in that narrative. And my problem, I suppose, with the idea that he's actively involved in founding the SAS is I've worked in a few of Phil's headquarters. If he pitched the idea to Arthur, uh, Arthur Smith and Arthur Smith took it seriously, why did Bill Sterling not write the document up and, and, and file it himself? Well, Bill was was returned to uh, had to was summoned back to to London on November the third, nineteen forty one, two weeks before the inaugural operation. And I think an interesting question, Tom, to to ponder is, uh, and I'll, I'll put it to you: Would you agree that after the failure of that inaugural operation, that that there we see David Sterling was exposed because he didn't have the brains of Bill, and had it not been for what Bill Fraser and Paddy Main achieved between them in December 1941 when they, uh, with their with their teams, they destroyed what, about 100 aircraft, that the SAS would probably have folded and that, that Sterling was really floundering in the winter of 41, 42. And he, obviously, they never had another parachute operation. And, and as I referred to earlier, he just went on in these on these poorly planned operations to Borat, to Benghazi. And it was only when they got the jeeps in June 1942 that they began to fulfil their potential, if you like. So I think that, again, that it, it consolidates my view that, that Bill Sterling was the brains. And, and there's two quotes I, I mentioned from uh, GHQ staff officers in the phony major. One saying, we all know Sterling's weakness, David Sterling's, for laying on his plans by the queerest methods his ideas of organisation are elementary, to say the least. That was in December 1941. And the uh, the reply was, I found that his natural impetuousness and importunity make it difficult for him to stick to any procedure. So this is this is what I say. We, we haven't um, mentioned the LRDG's role either. My view is that, that Sterling was physically very brave. He was an ideas man, but he wasn't very competent. And without his brother beside him. And then when when Jock Lewis was killed in December 1941, he was really lost. And he, and he turned the the SAS into, he recruited the likes of uh, Fitzroy McLean and, and Randolph Churchill, who really weren't suited to this sort of warfare. And, and for the first six months of 1942, as Guy Prendergast, the CEO of the LRDG, described it, it was like something out of Gilbert and Sullivan. Some of these I think, I think, very daring raids, but yeah. useless. I think I okay. So my take on this is that is that David Sterling, what he's really really good at, and I'm, I'm going to go on using this. He, he iterates, right? So after the first operation, he iterates. Him and Jock Lewis have that discussion to use the LRDG, and the reason they use the LRDG is because he's got drunk at Shepherds with Prendergast. Now the LRDG and the SAS fall out later on because basically El Detachment SAS is hopelessly disorganised. Now we can talk about that. I think the tragedy is is that what Sterling was good at was filling his capability gaps. From founding the unit, he knew he was a disorganised guy, right? But there are lots of disorganised guys. I mean, you know, famously, Richard Branson didn't know the difference between net and gross profit when he was running Virgin Airlines age 50. You can fill a capability gap. But what Sterling was doing was iterating. So the first one went wrong, then they iterated. And you're right. But the CEO of a unit does not have to make he doesn't have to fly a 747 or make computers or make a Tesla car. He has to be able to get people who can do that. And Fraser and Maine, you're absolutely right, were brilliant operators. But they didn't found the unit. They are founders, but they didn't found it. He's found it. And it's really interesting. I'm just going to finish on this thing about this. Uh, so you cited it was gen it was this bit about the middle management of GHQ constantly blocking him, which they do. So that that quote you read is, and I saw, I saw this as well. We all know Sterling's weakness for laying on plans by the queerest method. So Sterling at this point has got hold of a Wellington bomber, presumably through Peter Oldfield, who's a guy who works in JHQ, and they block it, right? But this is in December 1941. So why, and I'll ask both of you, this is an SS question, 
Why would Sterling want a Wellington bomber in December 1941? It's a specific airframe. It's not a Bombay, not a Whitley, not a Bristol, a Wellington bomber. Why? Well, if you were asking me, and I know next to all about Wellington bombers, uh, is it so you can jump out of it? He can jump out of a Bombay. Why a Wellington? I'm just asking the question. Come on, Gavin. This is, this is, a, this is like a, it's, a, it's an SAS insertion question. Why? Give, okay, look, let's situate it a bit. At that moment, they're trying to get on airfields and destroy them. They're parachuting. That hasn't gone wrong. They're going in with the LRGD and Fraser is going in on foot. But why? what would be useful about a Wellington bomber? I'll give you, I'll give you a clue. Dudley Clark uses a Wellington bomber because it looks a bit like a Heinkel 111 at night. Oh, so you can go because behind. You're trying to land on an enemy. You're trying to land on an enemy. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why I think it's an. I think that's why he asked for Wellington. He thinks he can get an SS team in it and land it on an airfield. Now I can't prove that, but GHQ don't give him the aircraft; they block it. But my my argument would be, it's a Wellington bomber. Give him the give him the bloody bomber. The SS are, are behind enemy lines. They're destroying airfields, and they want a Wellington bomber. It's one airframe with a crew of what two or three. This is the thing. He's constantly iterating and fighting against this resistance. And that's why I think he, he, he is a genius. Yeah. David Sterling is the genius here. Yeah. I, I do think that. I think that I think there's a difference between the sort of theory side of things. And, and I think Bill Sterling had that because with a place where I'll completely agree with, with, with Gavin is the early days with the locker lock training wing and the early commandos. Bill Sterling is the initiator of that. He's a great training officer. But there's a difference between a great training officer and someone's going to go on the front line, iterate, iterate to make this shit happen. OK, so if we shift it slightly to the early days and the role of Dudley Clark. Gavin, I think you said earlier that Dudley Clark comes up with a name and a, a few other things. I mean, the name Special Air Service, I think Tom would, would argue that Dudley Clark had a sort of larger role, but the name itself, I mean, that, that was a stroke of genius, wasn't it? Special Air Service? Yeah, no, I mean, he was, he was, a, he was great at, at uh, deceptive warfare. And, uh, but it's, you know, I, I don't think he's mentioned what, just once briefly in the Phantom Major and, and then Alan Ho's biography of, authorised biography of Sterling, which is written 30 years ago. He's just mentioned briefly there for coming up with the name, which Sterling said, does that, I think he equipped as, does the L stand for learner? But I, I don't think that, as Tom writes in his book, Dudley Clark was actually from about August the 16th. He left Cairo uh, for Europe and didn't return until after the inaugural raid. And so I disagree with Tom that Dudley Clark had, had any more influence than coming up with the, uh, with the name. Clark did, and Sterling credits him, I think he really did help him get it off the ground with GHQ and with recruitment, because I think Dudley Clark got them in with 11 Commando, which ultimately led to the recruitment of uh, Ian McGonagall Fraser, uh, because when Sterling goes and does his like song and dance down at Cabrit to recruit people, because he's struggling, I think Clark helps him there, and, and Sterling kind of mm-hmm. credits him with that. But I don't think, I don't say that Dudley Clark's the founder. The, 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 the reason I write a lot about Dudley Clark and the backstory of Special Forces is I'm, I'm trying to show what's unique about special forces is their strategic role. You know, a regular unit, and this is the difference between the SAS and everything that's gone before, except the very early commandos, so that's Clark's commando, is that it works for the force commander. So you constantly have this. So, so if you're in a regular unit, you've got seven layers of command. David Stone reports, reports direct to the force commander. And that's the point about all these sort of middle management bust ups, which he calls the fossilized shit, is that, uh, I mean, we're in official secrets, kind of, but like, let's just use the Second World War. If he wants a Wellington bomber, if he wants a G, he should get it because the force commander will give it to him. And that was actually established with the LRGG by Ralph Bagnold and Wavell. Wavell was the guy who sponsored that and said, yeah, you go do it. You're reporting directly to me. You don't report to any of this middle management. Going back to David Sterling a bit, one thing that I was quite persuaded by Gavin is is your argument that he's you know and I think this is something you'd both agree on that he's a great salesman he's fantastic at I guess the Wellington uh, bomber example accepted at really arguing with the senior command about what the SAS is doing and how important it is is that something Tom then that is perhaps his gift at being I a think, front man I think I think nobody's going to argue that, that Blair Paddy Main 
or, or William Fraser are far better operators than David Sterling in the desert. Nobody's going to argue that, but that's not his role. Where he's where he's brilliant and where's his genius is keeping them going, keeping them supported. And that is a constant fight. And, and we'll talk about this because I was quite interested in this letter where uh, Blair Paddy Main writes to Bill Sterling. This is after David's captured saying, I wish David was here because the disaster for the SES, I think, this is my opinion, is David Sterling's capture and then the unravelling. It gives GHQ the opportunity to dismantle the SES, which is what they've wanted to do for a very long time. And this guy, Cato, that they wanted to put in command of the SAS, he now gets the gig because Sterling isn't there. But if you go back even just a few months, the Auchinleck, who was then in command, is arguing for David Sterling. You can see it written all over the uh, the transcripts. You know, where's David Sterling in this mob? Because they're reorganising all the special forces. You know, And he thinks David Sterling should be, be, be in charge. And he calls him up to a meeting in the desert. And basically, they agree that they're going to have this four squadron SS regiment which would have been brilliant around the time of El Alamein, instead of which we have, you know, um, we have Maine uh, and um, Fraser operating with just one squadron out in front. You know, that's it. I mean, I, I think that's, we, we, we must touch on Sterling's conduct after the, so El Detachment was um, granted regimental status at the end of September 1942, expanded very quickly. And it, I mean, it's very interesting, as, as I detail in the phony major, that for what, well, well, as, as Tom has just uh, referred to, Maine and, and Fraser went up with a squadron behind the lines in Libya and harassed the Germans as they began to pull back after the Al Alamein offensive. Sterling spent much of November in hospital. And when he came out, he took B squadron up into the desert to. Uh, uh, to launch operations. Now, this was this was against the express orders of GHQ, who said he was not to go on operations. Sean Hackett, who was in command of uh, what was known then as, as Desert Raiding Forces, you know, the signals which I um, detail in the phony major were saying, where are you? What are you doing? And, uh, and of course, he then got himself captured. Now, Tom's absolutely right. That, that threw the SAS... Well, it exposed them, it made them vulnerable. And he had, you know, I'll be interested to hear what Tom thinks of Sterling's capture. But to me, it's the height of irresponsibility. And and um, there's a quote from Brigadier George Davy, who was director of military operations, who said that uh, when Sterling told him the route he was going to take, he was captured in Tunisia. He said, no, you're, you're, you're going far too close to the enemy. You need to change your route. But as, as Davy said, in his typical arrogant way, he ignored me. And, and so I think it was that is, again, another example of the, the irresponsibility and, and the arrogance of David Sterling that really did endanger his regiment. And it was it was because of Bill Sterling, who was then posted to uh, he was uh, he was taken out. By this time, he was in CO of number 62 commando, which would become two SAS. And he was sent to Cabrit by uh, uh, Laycock of Combined yeah, Operations yeah. to really see what was going on and make recommendations, et cetera. And uh, it's, uh, so it was a time of, uh, of, of real chaos. And, uh, and that was because of David Sterling. Yeah, I definitely, sorry, Tom. I, yeah, I definitely did want to ask about the capture because it is, I, I mean, I remember reading in your book, Gavin, about the capture, of, as you just mentioned, you're, you're pretty damning of it. Tom, What's your view on the capture of David but Sterling? Absolutely, no doubt, he was absolutely pushing his luck, and you, you can, you can, you can, you can say. But my, my, I mean, why was he going there? Why did he push his luck? And my, my feeling is because him and Sean Hackett had had a massive bust up with Monty, this well documented. So it's General Montgomery, because they needed troops. And one of the things that went wrong with B Squad and Gavin was they couldn't get any troops. They had raw recruits who were inexperienced. It's why the whole operation was a cock up. Right. And I think Sterling was pushing his luck to prove to 8th Army and to GHQ that they could do this job. Right. They couldn't. They didn't. They didn't have the resources. They didn't have even have the fuel. Montgomery and 8th Army had not supported them with enough equipment and fuel to, to even get out there. As Montgomery said, he said, once I reach what is it? Is it I will have no, no, no further use for your unit. So they're fighting a battle that is a publicity battle to keep the regiment in in, in, in operation. And that's what I feel happened. I think it, I think it is a, a tragedy. You know, we've both interviewed Mike Sadler. You know, 
but but that's the point really is that Mike Sadler was with them he didn't see this as a bad thing to do you know I mean they all loved David Stern that's the other thing I say all his troops loved him which is a bit indicative if you've got a commanding officer that's loved by his men I generally think that's that that thing that means he's a good bloke I dis- yeah. I disagree that he was loved by his men. I mean, I spoke to several, interviewed several World Detachment veterans, and they spoke quite dispassionately of, of David Sterling. Whereas Paddy Main, they they had much more reverence for. Well, yeah. Well, should we move on? Let's talk. Let's talk a bit about Bill Sterling because I think that we. So let's let me just start with this, Gav. So so the narrative of Bill Sterling, and this is where I think that that I disagree with you. Bill Sterling never goes into combat during the entire Second World War. Am I correct? He did go on Operation Knife in April 1940 to Norway with five other people from MIR, which is the forerunner of the Special Operations Executive. But en route, they were to, lead, uh, to land on Norway and then work with the Norwegian partisans in, in blowing up German lines of communications. But unfortunately, en route to Norway, their submarine hit a surface mine. So they had to return to Ross Seif. And it was there, actually, that Bill Sterling said they, they were told initially that there was going to be two or three days before they got a replacement submarine. So he said, well, let's come back to the estate at Keir, which is just outside Bridge of Allen in central Scotland, and we'll, uh, we'll wait until we uh, have a new submarine. And it was there that, as Peter Kemp, who was one of the six men, who was one of the great, was one of the great irregular warfare exponents of the Second World War, as he wrote, that it was there that Bill Sterling said, listen, so far, this has been a joke. This we, we know nothing about guerrilla warfare. We need to set up an establishment where we can learn, where we can train. And of course, this coincided. This was we're talking now, beginning of May 1940. That the the school, the set, the establishment uh, was the special training centre, which was established at Loch Islet in June 1940. Very, I mean, fortunate timing because, of course. Um, uh, Winston Churchill replaced Chamberlain as PM in, in May 1940. He was a great fan of, of irregular warfare and was the, you know, uh, the, the driving force behind the commandos. Um, and um, But no, to answer your question then, he didn't actually uh, see combat in World War II. No, but I think, I think so that's interesting because I completely agree with that. And Lord Lovett, you know, says the same thing. Bill Sterling creates this idea, which I would argue then segues with, because the guy who creates MO9 is Dudley Clark. So then people like David Niven pitch up at the training. Room. But then there's this weird thing where, so Bill Sterling is the, he's the chief instructor at that point. Brian Mayfield commands. Yeah, that's right, isn't it? So then there's this thing where you've got all the commandos, 7, 8, 11. They're all going to set sail to the Mediterranean to bust up the Italian coastline. Churchill wants them to go down there. And you've got, so MIR, which is which you referred to, uh, Peter Fleming works there, and he gets this Operation Yak gig, which is basically uh, sorry, it's a bit complicated, but he basically this is a job that Peter Fleming, who is a uh, is working for military intelligence, is given to go out to North Africa to convert Italian prisoners of war into British soldiers to create a Garibaldi battalion that can then fight for us. So those are battalions, and he recruits a team. He goes up for three days at the local training wing. And then presumably he bumps into Bill Sterling, because then on the 21st, Jan, in your book, Bill Sterling's posted to the Yak mission. And they all set out. So that's all the commandos, all the special forces go. They all set out for North Africa. But 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 Peter Fleming and Bill Sterling get to Freetown, realise they're going to go around the Cape. So they then fly to Cairo, right? And then Bill Sterling drops out of that mission. So why is that happening? What, what's going on there? Because I'm, I'm confused by that. Well, the Yak mission was a failure because they, they didn't realise that the Italians were very happy at being POWs and didn't want to, uh, to, uh, to fight anymore. So that's... Uh, and, and then, uh, yeah, so that's uh, perfectly described, Tom. And then to pick that up, so the Yak mission failed fairly quickly. They realised the Italians just weren't up for it. They were quite enjoyed lounging in the sun in North Africa. So Bill, though, was still employed at SOE. Now, this is there's a, there's a big... Um, SOE was very, um, it was an a incipient organisation, very badly structured at this time. And, and there was also, I mean, there began to be a turf war between um, GHQ and SOE, sort of encroachment on territory. Bill Sterling um, began to actually smuggle documents out yeah. with the help of that. Well, uh, well, Hermione Ranfurly did. Exactly, well, exactly yeah. with under okay. a bra, just, yeah. Sorry, can I just pause you there? Because I want to focus on the Yak mission, right? Because 
this is this is going to question Bill Stoney's war record is why I'm doing this. So Peter Fleming sends a signal to London going Bill Sterling or William Sterling has dropped out of the mission, but it may it'll make no difference to the mission. And at this point, they have been tasked with an operation. They've got to go to Greece to carry out guerrilla warfare. So Peter Fleming goes to Greece without Bill Sterling. And it's a nightmare. They, they end up with the Aussies trying to supply them with explosives. They drive an ammunition train up the front line, nearly get killed. They go back down to Athens, blow the coast road. And then finally, they're tasked with evacuating the embassy. So Peter Fleming and his team uh, provide the machine gunners on this militarised yacht, getting out the family and children in the embassy. They don't make it very far. They get to an island, at which point Peter Fleming gets them off because the German dive bombers come in. And they blow the shit out of them. They kill one of Peter Fleming's best friends. He gets injured and evacuated. And then they go back to Cairo, which is which I think has got to make an awkward moment in the Shepherd's Bar when Peter Fleming orders a John Collins and Bill Sterling has basically not gone on this operation. Even though Peter Fleming's the commander, you know, and he should have gone, in my opinion, he hasn't gone. Well, my my take on that is he actually returned to the Scots Guards for a while, who by now are in the desert. Brian Mayfield, who you mentioned earlier, who was a commandant at Loch Islet. He was um, he was out in North Africa too now with the Scots Guards. So he returned to the Scots Guards, and in fact, as I uh, describe in the phony major, it was there was a a fourth Sterling brother. So there were six yeah. Sterlings in total: two sisters, four brothers. Hugh, the youngest, um, was missing went missing in action uh, while attached to the Durham Light Infantry in in April 1941. Bill went up to the lines to look for him and couldn't find him, and uh, um, and it was at that point. So. My take on that is that Bill Sterling, who had very high standards and don't forget, uh, had been groomed to command from an early age because as the eldest of the six. And this is something, to, again, just sort of an, an, an important aside is that the Sterlings were very wealthy, very well connected and very aristocratic. So the mum, Margaret, was was one of these socialites of, yeah. the, of that sort of the Belle Epoque, if you like. And yeah. so. That undoundedly helped both okay. Bill and, and uh, David. Uh, we're, we're running out of time. Just uh, to finish that. So, so Bill got out to Cairo, saw really that yet again, the um, SOE, who at this point in the war, recruited on A, which school you went to, and B, if you worked in the city. So there were some superbly incompetent people. Bill didn't like incompetence. So he left SOE, got himself a job in GHQ, working, uh, as I said at the start, as a personal assistant to Lieutenant General Arthur Smith, the, the Chief of Staff. And so it was at the very heart of the, yeah. uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the war in North Africa. Well, OK, but there's, I mean, I'm just going to, OK, we're going to run out of time, aren't we? But, look, we we I'm, are, I, but, but, but carry on well, quickly. I want to drill down into the war because there's a very strange signal this time that goes from GHQ to, to London going, uh, Bill Sterling says he's got a place at Staff College, is this true? Or he goes, can you please confirm? Now, Bill Sterling, to my knowledge, does not attend Staff College. So Staff College is the senior training stuff. So you're right. It's what you do if you're going to become a commanding officer in normal times, right? You have to pass your Staff College exams, be nominated, and about six months out, you'd know you were going to Staff College. So Peter Fleming would have known, GHQ would have known, Scott Scars would have known, so what's that signal about? Because I think it sounds like maybe he's lying because there's there's no record of him going to Staff College or having a place at Staff College. When does that signal sent? It's sent. I'll tell you what, I can probably supply all this. It's We don't know, but it's in his war record straight after the Fleming uh, signal. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it may well have been because, of course, he was summoned back when the War Office discovered that... Uh, in, in late October 1941, that he'd, because he didn't tell them Bill Sterling, and I think this is indicative of yeah, the story. He didn't tell them. That, that so was didn't... very much the Sterling's modus operandi. They they, they do as they both please. Brothers. Sterling. Both brothers. Both brothers. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely both brothers. Okay. So I'm going to just, because I know we're going to write our time game. So I want to go through this. So he then goes SSRS. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And he doesn't go on any operations Force across the channel. Raiding force. Doesn't yeah, go yeah. on any operations across the channel, right? Yeah. Then he comes out, 6-2 commander, we come back out to Africa, and this is the run into 2SAS, yeah? yeah? And this is where, so there are a lot of operations. In fact, one of the officers, Appleyard, you say he has a mental breakdown because he's on so many operations. Not a mental breakdown, he's just sort of uh, 
worn out. So Bill Sterling combat Mexican, stress. Let's yeah. call it combat yeah. stress. He combat has a he has some sort of break. One of his officers has a breakdown, yeah. and then we're into two SES, and then two SES go to Italy. Where does Bill? And so he's now commanding officer of a regiment, four squadrons that deploy to Italy. Where does Bill Sterling go? Well, in September 1943, he returns to London and that he begins to um, to plan for the expansion of the SAS into a brigade. And he'd, okay. I think he'd, he'd planned to, he'd hoped to to lead that, um, to, to lead the SAS brigade, which but I think... He doesn't, been, okay, I'm just going to... He doesn't, doesn't and, go to Italy. He doesn't go to Italy. When does he come back? So he comes back, he, he goes, so initially, S2 SAS raised May 1943, then um, th that's in Algiers is where they're based. Um, and they, their first operations are in various islands, uh, Lampedusa, for example, uh, um, in, uh, in May, June 1943. The first significant operation is Operation Chestnut in July 1943 in Sicily. Um, and then there's various operations but, in. Okay, but okay, but I'm going to I'm going to be really. We are sorry, running out of time. Yeah, so yeah, I, just, yeah. I just one. Okay, I'm just going to say this. So you've got a commanding officer of an SAS um, regiment. Yeah. There's four squadrons in the field in yeah. combat, and he goes to England. And in fact, he doesn't return till January. And when he returns, there's a mutiny in the regiment. They want to get rid of him. Oh no 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 no! That's that's uh, there's a mutiny among up a certain section of upper class. Officers, no, all uh, the officers. Roy, Roy Farron describes them as half-assed fighting types. Okay, um, okay, I'm going gonna, gonna to pick you up on that because one of those. I think we. Uh, it's look. I'm going to have to dive in because uh, Gavin has an, yeah, a, a, a it, very it, nice we're, we're, we're in the lunch. Middle of the field. Come on, I've got he a, drop a he has, coming up. <laughs> he has a very good lunch waiting for him, and I okay. think he's been told he has to go in one minute. I mean, I, I only wish we had had Ridley Scott here to witness this debate between two historians can i just make a, a very quick final point um what we didn't talk and, and what i uh, i thought was uh, wonderful of, about tom's uh, book is paying tribute to bill fraser who yeah. has been really overlooked and, and we saw that in bbc rogue heroes he i think he's, he's he flits in and out um very briefly but he was a uh, he was an extraordinary um, SAS soldier, and what, and and of course, he. I think no other off, no other SAS officer saw as much much active service as Bill Fraser in World War Two, including Paddy Main, uh, and he's been overlooked by history. So it's great that uh, Tom and, and me, to a lesser extent, are, are sort of shining a light on Bill Fraser. Oh well, that's nice. A rare moment of agreement. <laughs> so we agree on some things. I think exactly, I think yeah. like a rematch on the Bill Sterling story, though. <laughs> I'm not convinced by Bill Sterling, but you know, I think you know, I, and Gavin, you're you're an excellent historian, thorough research. But I think the nuance of Bill Sterling is that, I, in my opinion, if you're a CEO of a combat unit, you've got to go into combat. You cannot uh, well, command a regiment. If well, you we'll, we'll, uh, that's actually just a rule. That's actually we'll, just a rule now. I uh, was. Tony Greville Bell, who was who uh, was a two SAS officer and uh, one of the original two SAS officers, and then served in Malaya with two two SAS. He told me that uh, he described the difference between Bill and, and David, and and said David was very much the younger brother, the more physical kind, and and Bill was more cerebral. And that he said yes, he never went in operations, but as in in his view, Tony Greville Bell's. That is the right thing to do. But I suggest a rematch, Tom. Yeah. The time We've got as far as 43. To, to, coincide, to, to coincide with D-Day, Ollie, because, of course, Bill Sterling, yeah. that's when he had yeah. his... We've got all that. Stuff. All that to Great come stuff. in part well, two. Well, OK, so let's uh, let's speak before June next year. Yeah. And and uh, I'm going to put in a, uh, a little picture of us doing this chat. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but thanks, thanks so much. Oh, both thank both you. your books, thank you, Gavin. Gavin nice new lunch. book out, and yeah, Tom's cheers. book. We all know. Thanks so much for listening. Please do share, share, share. Greatest British Commanders next week, and plenty more episodes to come, including Adam Zamoyski's take on the film Napoleon. Until then, thank you, and good night. Mm -hmm.